Fair Use Copyright Disclaimer Copyright Disclaimer Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, commenting, news reporting, teaching, scholarship and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. The following video is for educational purposes only. going over the five ways that buildings are engineered to resist earthquakes. Explained simply by me, Matt Picardle, a structural engineer in the California area. One big misconception that we need to get out of the way first. Buildings are not earthquake proof. They will get damaged during big earthquakes, but structural engineers design these buildings so they don't collapse, so people can evacuate the building safely after an earthquake. It's similar to getting in a car accident where your vehicle may be heavily damaged, but you're safe and can evacuate the vehicle. Same thing with buildings. But why do we even need structural engineers to design buildings? Can't we just build them like Legos and they'll stand up? Sure, non-engineered buildings may stand up, but during an earthquake or heavy winds, they're most likely going to collapse. Which brings us to number five, using moment frames. Non-engineered buildings have very weak joints. So structural engineers sometimes use what they call moment frame connections to strengthen these joints. These are basically joints that are heavily welded or heavily bolted. Here I'm stiffening the joints up on this MOLA model kit. It's a kit that was designed to simulate the structural behavior of buildings. And stick till the end if you want a 20% discount on these. Now let's put it through an earthquake. It's still standing, but it does seem to wobble and deform quite a bit. And that's one of the cons of using a moment frame system, along with it not being the most economical solution, but Architects love them because you don't have any walls or braces in the way. You can open up the floor plan a lot more with these. And number four are bracing systems. These are the bread and butter for steel buildings. Braces are stiff, strong, and economical against resisting earthquakes, but they do get in the way of the architecture. Braces, as the name suggests, brace the building during earthquakes, and they are effective. If we install braces on the MOLA model, you can see that during earthquakes, they are stiffer and deform less than the ones ones with the moment frames. And there is an engineering secret to using these braces. Structural engineers often design these braces as the fuse of the building during an earthquake event. Earthquake forces attack the weakest link in the building and these braces are it. But don't worry, they're designed to take a beating. They're designed to be very ductile. Basically, they can deform and get mangled without tearing apart. Similar to if you tried to mangle or split apart a paperclip. It's very hard to do. The earthquake forces focus all of their energy on the weakest link, the brace. And that's good because they ignore the most important parts of the structure, which are the beams, floor systems, and columns. And trust me, you do not want the earthquakes attacking the columns. Number three are the shear wall systems. Structural engineers call them shear walls, but they're basically walls that take the earthquake forces and they prevent the building from shearing off the foundation. And these are the bread and butter for concrete and wood buildings. When we install shear walls on the MOLA model, you can see that these are basically the strongest and the stiffest of the structural systems. So it's pretty common for you to see them used in mid-rises and high-rise projects. They're the most economical option to resist earthquake forces as well, but they're also the architect's worst nightmare because it's a wall. I mean, who wants to stare at a wall? Number two are dampers. Dampers reduce the earthquake vibration on the building or structure, and there's various damper systems, such as liquid-filled dampers, a mass tuned dampers, or viscous dampers. But for today, let's focus on liquid-filled dampers. Unlike the previous systems that we've been going over, this is not a brute force method system where bigger equals better. A real world application of this is a water tank filled damper placed on top of a building. The water sloshes around in the damper during an earthquake and this sloshing reduces the earthquake vibrations to the structure. Let's do this to our MOLA model. First, let's see how it reacts to an earthquake without a liquid filled damper. 
Now let's fill this damper up with water and put it on top of the structure and let's put it through an earthquake. Comparing these two models, you can see that the water damper helps a lot with reducing earthquake vibrations. And number one is seismic base isolation. This method is probably the closest thing to earthquake proofing a building. This involves essentially putting roller skates under the building so it's kind of floating above the ground. I mean, you can't get hit by an earthquake if you're not touching the earth, huh? Real world applications of this involve putting these base isolators, which are usually in the form of uh, ball bearings, rubber bearings, or friction bearings underneath the structure. So let's see this in action with our MOLA model. First, let's see how it reacts to an earthquake without base isolation. Now let's install the base isolation system. Here are some ball bearings. Let's put the building on top of those so it's essentially floating and earthquake. Comparing both of those, you can see how much base isolation helps, and I'm actually shaking the seismic base isolated structure a lot more than the unisolated one. Fortunately, this technology is still underused in most of the world, mostly reserved for high-profile projects, hospitals, and historic retrofits.